Greetings. Welcome to The Dividing Line. It is a warm day here in Phoenix, Arizona, which is not really saying anything unusual. We're only a degree below the record for the day. And it's like 2021 looks like it's just going to be a continuation of 2020 anyways. But here we are. Welcome. And uh, let's uh, let's hope this is not an indication of what is to come. <laughs> There is no way we're going to be able to survive beating 2020's summer. That no, no, no. There will be a mass exodus if that if that takes place. Got our uh, skillet shirt on today, so we are ready to rock and roll. Literally, um, thanks for being with us. Uh, want to respond to just a couple hours ago the posting of uh, a statement by J.D. Greer the sort of president of the Southern Baptist Convention, not really legally, but because um, this is three years now and uh, it's only supposed to be two and COVID came along and they decided just to punt on that. I think that was really a bad idea. But uh, anyway, J.D. Greer posted this on Twitter. I realize that some pastors are likely unaware of the history of certain racial stereotypes in calling or comparing our vice president to Jezebel. But that doesn't make such statements any less unwise. There are times we will critique policies, but that should not include personal attacks on a newly elected, notice, personal attacks on a newly elected official God has told us to honor and pray for. Let us speak clearly and boldly for righteousness, but in a way that honors what the scriptures say about honoring our leaders. We don't correct one sin through another. So it's hard to avoid the conclusion that Dr. Greer, uh, the president of the Baptist Convention, believes it is sinful um, to do what uh, myself and uh, Dr. Tom Buck have done. And others have done, and that is to make the argument that the worldview that is motivating the new regime and that is seen explicitly in Kamala Harris in her positions on the key issues in regards to human life, that is everything that God has said in his word about what mankind is, the origin of mankind, the transcendent value of mankind being made in the image of God, the reality that in Jesus' own words, in Matthew chapter 19, from the beginning, God created them male and female. Hence, the issues of homosexuality, lesbianism, marriage, polyamory, bisexuality, and of course, now, the explosive letter in the alphabet soup of moral degeneracy, the T, transgenderism, which truly destroys everything that comes before it, because you can't really define any of the other letters once the T is included, because all the other letters assume a gender binary to be even defined relatively in a relatively meaningful manner. Um, she has made her position on all these issues very plain, and they are all in direct opposition to biblical revelation, biblical morality, the historical perspective of this nation and its laws. And I haven't even touched on abortion. I really did when I talked a little bit about the image of God, but abortion, the infant born alive act, uh, any, any limitation on abortion up to the point of birth itself. She has made her positions known. Um, impartial organizations identified her in 2019 as the most leftist senator in the United States Senate. We can't talk right now about how in the world she ended up as vice president of the United States, but what we can talk about 
is the fact that there are people saying, well, look, isn't this wonderful? We now have a woman vice president who is not white. She's not a descendant of Europeans. She has a very mixed ethnic heritage. Not African-American, despite what people would like to say. Um, that's not where she's coming from, eth ethnically wise. And I think it's just so stupid that we're even talking about that part. But she's the one forcing it on us uh, and the worldview that she presents. So people are saying we should look up to this person who has broken the glass ceiling. Glass ceiling of what? Well, women were only, wait, what? Women. But her worldview says that a guy with male anatomy and enough testosterone to run a diesel truck who has to shave three times a day can call himself a woman. And we have to treat that guy as a woman and even memorize whatever whacked out pronouns they want to force upon us to use for them. That's her worldview. And so a lot of us have said, wait a minute. It doesn't matter what her gender is. It doesn't matter what her ethnicity is. Character matters and character is determined by how you live your life and by what standards. And a standard that says there is no male or female. There are 148 genders. Marriage isn't between one man and one woman. It can be any mixture of things. Life in the womb is not sacred. It can be destroyed by any means at any time, even without parental agreement. All of those beliefs are morally evil. And as a result, they will bring God's judgment against the person who acts upon them and promotes them to others. This was not a controversial Christian position even 10 years ago. Even 10 years ago, if I start off a program with what I'm starting off now, people would have gone, what is, what's with him? Like, duh. But now you're being called sinful by the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. If you dare go, you know, we might not want to point people to Kamala Harris as an example for our daughters, because the worldview that she is promoting is destructive to any meaningful society at all. Oh, you terrible person. You're supposed to pray for our leaders and honor them. Really? So what you think Paul was saying in 1 Timothy chapter 2 or what Peter was saying is that we should honor the worldview of Nero Caesar, the beast of the book of Revelation. <laughs> you know, take that one. Um, you're, you're to honor that. Well, no. Well, that's what we're talking about. We are talking about the fact that there is a worldview that is out front. It isn't hidden. It's not being secretly snuck in around the back. It's straight up front. It is motivated. How many executive orders now? Over, is it over 30? Yeah, I think it's over 30. Some ridiculous number. I think it's getting close to 40. It is behind all of that. And when, when the so-called Equality Act, I call it the Abomination Act, and I think it's an appropriate term, when that act comes before the Senate, it's already been passed by the House. When that act comes before the Senate, let's say that somehow, amazingly, uh, all the Republicans actually maintain some type of a spine. There are three of them that, anyway. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if a couple of Democrats grew a spine on, on this? But that's probably not going to happen either. But let's say it came down to 50-50. Guess who's, guess who's casting the tie-breaking vote? Kamala Harris. 
And what has she already told us she will do? She will force this abomination, this violation of every element of God's law, this this law that every single one of the founders who created the Declaration of Independence and then crafted the Constitution would have found to be an abject invitation for God to rain fire and brimstone upon this nation. She will vote for it. But we live in the day where, as Vody Balcom said, I think it was last weekend when, when he was speaking, for him, the 11th commandment is, thou shalt be nice. Now, the 11th commandment amongst seven ba- Southern Baptists is, thou shalt not speak against fellow Southern Baptists. But thou shalt be nice. And our culture defines niceness as going along to get along. Well, the fact of the matter is, the left... If you have if you have not recognized that they are on a full bore scorched earth, this is our chance to get rid of this thing called the Constitution and all the opposition and establish one party rule that will then allow us to hand the keys to the CCP and they'll come through San Francisco because San Francisco, I think, is actively inviting them. Just I, if If Chinese troop ships showed up off of San Francisco, I think they would set off fireworks and welcome them with 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 open arms. I really do. I mean, did you see? I listened to uh, Al Mohler this morning talked about the San Francisco school board. Removing, was it 42 names, 42 schools are going to rename no more George Washington, no more Abraham Lincoln. All, any founders whatsoever, gone. They're even taking, um, what's her face? The current, older, I, I can see her and the name just escaped me. The, the California senator, the, the senior. That's what happened to me. <laughs> that woman. Yes. Right. I know. Her. Both, both Rich and I are doing the old man thing right now. <laughs> Feinstein. Ah. They're even taking her name. You know why they're taking her name off? Because 20 some odd years ago, she opposed a gay marriage ordinance or something, even though she's for it now. I mean, there is zero mercy and forgiveness amongst the woke, man. I mean, you, you, you cannot stay far enough to the left to stay away from the buzzsaw of the social justice movement. You're you're toast. They're even going to take her name off. I wonder what she thinks about that. She sold her soul for decades to promote leftism in San Francisco, and she's still not far enough to the left. It's just, wow. It gives you an idea where they're going. But the point is, you have in San Francisco right now a total repudiation of American history. Total repudiation of American history. We th- This is a place where people do not want to be Americans any longer. And they're not. They're not. They are repudiating everything, the entirety of the history. Wipe it out. So I think they'd invite them all in. I really do. This is Kamala Harris's state. Okay, that's that's where she's coming from. So you have this incredible immoral revolution flowing across the land and what are Big Eva's leaders concerned about? Being nice in saying we disagree. Folks, the time for saying we disagree is long past. If people don't know by how you're living and by how you're proclaiming the gospel and calling for repentance from an evil nation that you disagree, oh. So they always want to uh, let us speak clearly and boldly for righteousness, but let's just not do it like the prophets did. Let's not even do it the way Jesus did it. Jesus took Jezebel. Now, Jezebel, and I preached on this Sunday night. The reason I preached on Sunday night was not simply to uh, double down or anything else. 
I had written the article that appeared on the Theology Matters blog in response to Danny Aiken and Danny Aiken's anemic little uh, statement were talking. He was responding to the religion news article about, again, Jezebel. Disappointing and uncalled for. I do not agree with POTUS and VP on many issues. I am so tired of this. I thank you very much for informing us as Christian ministers that you do not agree with the people who are 1,000% committed to the destruction of marriage, the destruction of human sexuality, the destruction of the human being as a whole, the destruction of human life in the soul, in, in, in the uh, womb, um, gender. I mean, so thank you for letting us know you don't agree with the anti-Christians. We sort of guessed that. If that's all you can do, then why are you... Why are you bothering? As I said in the article, don't waste the keystrokes. If that's all you can do. I don't hear these guys. Where's, where's the sermon from J.D. Gert? Because remember, he's the one that says God whispers about sexual sin. Where is his sermon identifying the Equality Act as an abomination from the pit of hell? Don't tell me he doesn't know what testosterone does to a 13-year-old girl's body. Don't tell me he hasn't taken the time to read Irreversible Damage and read the descriptions of what happens to a 13-year-old's body when you inject her with testosterone for weeks on end. Aside from changing her voice, making her chin broader, there are certain female parts that atrophy and may never recover. Where's the sermons about the moral evil of that? These guys are dads. They have daughters. What are you doing? Man up. Man up. I don't see them talking about that. I don't see them talking about the horrific results that this worldview is going to have on men and women, especially women. It is such an anti-woman worldview. That's what, that's the... That's what was behind the original statement. Why would the Israelites say to their daughters, emulate her? Why would any Christian say to their daughters, emulate Kamala Harris, when Kamala Harris's moral worldview is fundamentally opposed to being a woman? That's the irony of the whole thing. Where, where has the moral clarity Gone. Well, I'll tell you where it's gone. We now call people to repent, but don't tell them what to repent of. We're scared to. And on our side, because we know it's going to cost us. And once the Equality Act passes, it will cost us. It's costing us right now with the big corporations that are getting rid of everybody. You could lose your job. Kick, get kicked out of social media, not be able to communicate. Who knows? Maybe your bank will stop processing your payments. That's happening. But now when the government gets involved and makes it part of law, well, now. Now you could be forcing the lesser magistrates, the police officers to come along and to enforce proper groupthink. A groupthink that's exactly opposite to what Jesus taught us. Why aren't you people on the front lines fighting this stuff? You really think they're going to let you slide just because you tried to be nice? They're not going to, guys. They're not going to. You may get to the gulag a little bit slower than the rest of us do, but you're still going to get there. And you're going to get there compromised. But let me mention something else. I realize that some pastors are likely unaware of the history of certain racial stereotypes. Let me stop you a second. Where do we start here? We start with biblical examples, biblical revelation. Now, there could be 20 different uses of the Jezebel character in cultures and histories around the world that I wouldn't know about. There could be 
who knows, in somewhere in Botswana or Zimbabwe or something, there could be something over there. There could be something in Thailand. Maybe they did something with Jezebel at some point. I don't know. Am I supposed to know? Does J.D. Greer know? Has J.D. Greer done an exhaustive study of all cultural references to Jezebel based upon script, the, the, the distribution of the Bible around the world? No, he hasn't. No, he hasn't. And so the, the idea repeated by numerous people in social media is, well, of course, you know, you're doing something more here. You can't really be so focused just upon this idea of the worldview that she, but that's not all important. No, that is, that is the whole issue. And that's what allowed Jesus, the risen king of the church, to take the reference, the reference to Jezebel and apply it to the prophetess in the church of Thyatira. That's what made it work. Is that her sins were so well known, the destructiveness of her sins were so well known that Jesus parallels that in saying what he's going to do to this prophetess in the church. Jesus used that as an example. Didn't Jesus know what racial stereotypes that might bring up in the future? He was God. He would know those things, wouldn't he? But he still used it because it was appropriate. Because you're only going to be judged for what your intention was in your words in making application in that context. And what I'm going to say now, and I will not apologize for, is that the worldview of this current regime and the worldview that will moderate Kamala Harris in however it's done in the United States Senate today. She has been put in the position, we can have an honest discussion as to how in the world she got there, but, we can, but she's been put in a position where when a fundamentally destructive, rebellious piece of legislation comes before that body, and if there is a 50-50 vote, what will motivate her hand in reaching forward to make the deciding vote? And is the worldview that motivates that hand that has been seen in every vote she took in the United States Senate, in every action she took as the Attorney General of the state of California. Yes, good old communist California. What has motivated the movement of that hand? Is it not the very same worldview that brought Jezebel to her destruction that God prophesied would take place? If you're going to make an argument, you need to say, well, no, I mean, Jezebel, Jezebel brought Baal worship into Israel. What do you think bowing to the current culture in regards to transgenderism is? Is that not idolatry? Of course it's idolatry. She taught Jezebel brought sexual immorality. Yeah. You want to talk about gay marriage? You want to talk about homosexuality? You want to go there? See, they won't, I, everybody who's done this stuff, um, um, Todd Harding went after me, uh, Sunday night, just claimed he was watching the sermon, but then completely misrepresented it. So it just gives you an idea of what wokeism does to people, but said it was just bashing government and stuff like that. The reality is these folks cannot provide, they cannot engage in actual dialogue on this subject. Danny Aiken can't, J.D. Greer can't, Todd Harding can't. You know why? Because it would require them to openly recognize and acknowledge the fundamental parameters of the worldview motivating the Biden-Harris regime. And once that's on the table, in light of scripture, it's done. It's done. 
it's all over with. They can't, they can't go there. So we get the the ubiquitous. Well, you know, um, I don't agree. Um, or we 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 need to we will critique policies. Oh, we will critique policies. Thank you, Dr. Greer. There are times we will critique policies, but that should not include personal attacks. Oh, so if you identify Kamala Harris's worldview as containing the same elements of rebellion against God that brought Jezebel to her destruction, and that here you have a woman in position of power, using her position of power to bring destruction to a people. But you just want to critique policies. What would JD have said when the prophecy was given as to what was going to happen to Jezebel? Now, Lord, now, Lord, that's a little extreme. That's where we are today. That's where we are today. We're actually being told you, that's, that's sinful. You're engaging in sin to even warn her that there will be judgment coming for what she has done. I, part of it is, I don't think most of these people think, honestly believe, that government officials are going to be judged for what they do as government officials. I think that has become so much a part of the thinking of much of evangelicalism that they that myth of neutrality, it's, I, don't, I just don't think they actually believe it. I just don't think they actually believe it. Uh-oh. Looks like the rich cans got a bit getting fired up. Hey, you and I are both wearing plaid shirts on the same day. How about that? Is that and we're both doing the same thing. We got yep, mm, that that we didn't plan that. Right? Uh, we did not. No. We did not. So my question is, why doesn't JD Greer, why doesn't Danny Aiken, why don't these men consider where their feet are planted when they stand before God? Exactly what kind of judgment comes from them. If we look at Romans 1 and we look at the end, there's something about the ones who give hearty approval. And they, he can sit there and say, well, we know we disagree here and we disagree there. I'm sorry. Yeah, they, they, Sp- their response is, oh, I don't give approval. Yeah. I just think that there is a, a better way to disagree. And it's like, it's there are issues of agreement and disagreement. Mm-hmm. And then there are straightforward acts of rebellion. Yeah. And that's what we're talking and, about here. And I, I, I read the man's words. I read both their words. And I see someone who, however you want to categorize it, the fact is his feet are standing in the same place hers are. There is compromise up one side and down the other. And he's more spineless than Mitt Romney, frankly, in my oh, opinion. Oh, Sorry. oh, oh, it's there. oh, ouch! Did you see? Did you see the uh, article that Mitt Romney has an eighty-four percent approval rate amongst two Utah Democrats? Democrats. Yeah. He has a yeah. higher approval rating amongst Utah Democrats than he does Utah Republicans. Yeah. So likening anybody. To- <laughs> to Mitt Romney. I hope you're ready to answer the phone. That's well, all. I'm I- fine with it. I'm <laughs> fine with it because this this is mealy mouthed. This is so weasel. This is this is this is the politician who's more than happy to stab the outgoing army that's being driven out in the back while they're going out because hey, we're welcoming the bad guys. Come on in, you know. And then they get driven out and when, oh gee, you're you're upset with me. You're angry. Um, wow. I do not know how anyone, and I made this comment to someone today, I don't know how anyone tries to balance being political with being in the ministry in a day when what is needed is a clarion warning to this culture. The road that you are firmly setting your feet upon will lead to destruction. God will not be mocked. You have profaned his ordinance of marriage. You have profaned his creation ordinance of male and female. You have profaned the sanctity of the womb in which he says he knits us together. And God will judge 
every nation that promotes this sinfulness, you must turn from this sinfulness. And I just believe that a large majority of people have bought the lie that salvation in Jesus is just some personal thing between you and God. It's you getting your ticket punched and going to heaven. This idea of Jesus being Lord and defining who man and woman is and how they're to relate to one another and what childbirth is about and everything, that's all gone. That's all gone. I I don't know what these folks are preaching about on a regular level, on a regular Sunday. I really don't. Uh Uh-oh. One more time. I think about all the times in the Old Testament where, and the new king comes along and he did great evil in the sight of the Lord. And what's going on in the temple? They're dragging in the Ashtaroth. They're dragging in the Baals. Syncretism. And we're sitting back going, I, you know, I don't know necessarily agree with the Ashtaroth and Baal, but, you know. But, hey, the king said. King said, they're here. You know, we can be, uh, you know, we, we just double down, double down. You know, they might actually help things out. Who knows? Give them a chance. Uh, <sighs> hey. I wanted to play this because this is this is really cool. Um, I I I don't know how big I can get this. I really can't. Um, oh wait a minute! Never mind. Copy link address. Go to YouTube. <laughs> Uh, here we go. Let's see if we can. Okay. All right. Biggest problem, Pearson. Hold on, hold on, hold on. And boom. Now, I just wanted to play this. I wasn't going to go that long on that, but I started preaching. But it is relevant. This is from 1967. Now, that means I, I, I remember watching Dragnet. Uh, I was uh, four going on five uh, when this initially aired. And we know how the media has been used as a mechanism for the destruction of this this nation. But this was uh, this was a long time ago. And I just want to play it just to remind us of where we once were and where we've gone. Did you see this? Okay. Okay, here we go. What's your biggest problem, Pearson? All of them. Narcotics, Grand Theft Auto, drinking, shoplifting. We got them all. It's not just a problem of law enforcement. It's a community problem. The trouble is there's no community, Captain. These people come piling in here from everywhere. They don't know each other and don't want to. They come out here, make a down payment on the house, and move in with a couple of kids. That doesn't mean they made a home. No more than giving a name to a place makes it a community. Yeah, and you get a little weary of hearing every kid give you the same excuse when you tag them. You don't understand. I just want to belong. That's why I did it. Belong to what? What it boils down to is the new morality, doesn't it? A whole new sense of values. The kids see it on television, in magazines, even hear it from the pulpit. God is dead. Drug addiction is mind-expanding. Promiscuity is glamorous. Even homosexuality is praiseworthy. How are you going to fight that? It ain't easy. But you got to remember that the vast majority of the juveniles you're handling are the kids next door. They're not hardcore criminals. It's just that for them, it's a great deal more important to be accepted by the other kids than to please their parents. Maybe if you put a couple of men on the lecture circuit, talk to the schools, the PTAs. I got 104 schools, Captain. I got 10 men. You got 12 now. Nineteen sixty-seven, man, <clears throat> that was a great show. I, I, I mean, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. That's right. That's right. That's that's a that's a very good. Uh, you know, just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. Uh, you couldn't get away with that today, uh, and and of course, no one no one tries to get away with that. But um, all right, next I've got um, this. And, uh, oh goodness, I'm not sure how long this is all going to go today. Um, and we started late. Uh, Phil Vischer, of course, of VeggieTales fame, is as woke as you can get. I mean, 
I guess the reason that people keep making reference to him and things like that uh, it was because of VeggieTales. But look, the, the guy's got two left wings. He's as, he's as woke as they come. And it's like, he's not saying anything that all the other woke people aren't saying. So I'm not sure why he gets quite as much attention as he does. But he uh, he had Jamar Tisby on. And of course, we've watched the trajectory of Jamar Tisby over uh, a number of years now, uh, moving farther and farther and farther to the left. And now he's into the... if. Uh, the anti-racism stuff. And so what you need to understand is this is another abusive language. He's literally going to say that you are either promoting racism or you're fighting racism. There is no middle ground. And of course, the definition of racism is the new definition, not the biblical definition of racism, not uh, treating someone uh, unjustly on the basis of hatred and thinking that you're better because of your skin color. No, 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 no. And as you listen to this conversation, what I want to point out to you is how America-centric it is. It is meaningless in Canada. It's meaningless in Mexico. It's meaningless in Saudi Arabia. It's meaningless in Zimbabwe. It's meaningless in Russia. It's super meaningless in, in, in China. Um, it's all us and our history and how our history is there, there is no past. What happened in the past is as much a reality today. There can be no progress. There can be nothing. Today is as bad as uh, 1859. It's, it's just as bad. But it's only about certain groups. So I've pointed out, uh, I don't know if you saw the horrific video and it was just, and I realized, I found out later on, it was just a security cam video. I, I was thinking someone was recording this and they were probably, that meant it was a setup. It wasn't, it was security cam video of a black man, a black 19 year old man attacking and knocking to the ground an 84 year old uh, man from Thailand and killing him. He died. And there is a tremendous amount, evidently, in that. And this is in San Francisco. There's a tremendous amount of, of anti-Asian black racism. There's a tremendous amount of black racism. I mean, I mean, there's just a huge amount of black racism. And that's exactly what you would expect from a biblical perspective. Why? Because you're telling a community for years on end that you can't commit a certain sin. That's the best way to produce a sin I've ever thought of. Tell a whole group of people, you can't be this sin. That's going to make sure that you're probably going to get a lot of that sin amongst those people. It's absurd. It's evil. But it is the, the, the standard orthodoxy today, and it's part and partial of the woke message. So you will get <clears throat> a... Now, what's interesting is Phil Vischer will in a snarky way, push back with objections, which shows they know exactly what the issues are. They won't deal with the actual presentation of meaningful arguments about it, but they know what the issues are. So I want you to hear a little bit of use of religious language at the beginning and then filling that religious language with completely political social justice, neo-Marxism after that, rather than, well, you know, here we have this biblical example here, or actually, you know, we need to be careful not to, to uh, just use American examples here, uh, but, you know, social justice in the Philippines looks different than social justice in China, which looks different, you know, that kind of stuff. You don't get that. It's all... You know, we're going to do the equality and equity thing solely on the basis of the black experience in the United States, not the Chinese experience in the United States, not the Irish experience, in the, not the Italian experience. No, no other group. That doesn't matter. They don't they don't fit the narrative. Because all sorts of other groups have been disadvantaged over time. Well, they were never enslaved. I would say that the Chinese were. I, I would say that the that the working conditions of Chinese workers in the Western part of the United States at a later time 
closer to our time were worse than many situations under slavery decades down, or down the way. So you, if you applied this thinking, there should be reparations for Chinese Americans. The problem is Asians are actually being discriminated against because of this narrative in jobs and education because they do so well because they don't allow what happened back then to determine where they are now. So, so here's Jamar Tisby uh, with uh, Phil Vischer. Let's, uh, let's listen to what they had to say. We're fighting for racial justice. That's kind of a controversial term because p- different people define it differently. How do you define it? Just so we know when we're going into the book. Yeah. So it, it, it means um, giving people what they are due. And in the case of racial justice, number one, it's shaped biblically by the doctrine of the image of God and, and, and what God says we are due uh, as human beings. It speaks to the, the grand and simple. Can I just point out that even in Jesus's own parables, he said that a an employer has the right to bring workers in at different times and yet pay them all the same. Was that equality and equity? Um, he his parables talk about kings and the rights of kings to engage in war, to execute people, to punish servants who do not um, perform in the way they knew they should in front of a king. These are all things that Jesus said. And obviously, we have to take those parables and then make application globally, not just in the United States. If we make application in the United States based upon a particular enforced reading of our own history and then export that outside the United States, the result has been disastrous and is damaging to the cause of the gospel. Just thought I'd mention that in light of what was, when it, when it said, what we're due, due on what basis? Well, as human beings. Okay. Does that mean that you are owed the same position as someone else? What's going to happen here is he's, he's going to argue that because of what happened 160 years ago, or even 60 years ago, that black Americans should be given advantages over white Americans today to allow them to catch up in the race. That's going to be the, that's, you know, the affirmative action stuff and reparations and, and all the rest of that stuff. And we see once you cross the border into Canada, that's no longer relevant. Once you go across the border in, in Mexico, that's no longer relevant. Totally different situations. And so it's, this is just in America. But they don't leave it just in America. That's that's the problem with that. So that's that's the difference between equality and equity, as it's going to be defined here. Okay, so. But oh, so difficult to live out principle, loving one's neighbor as oneself, um, and it speaks to the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself has absolutely positively nothing to do with the color of his skin, and in the church, it has nothing to do with who his ancestors were. has nothing to do with who his ancestors were, whatsoever. If I have, I I was talking with a couple that's just joining our church um, Sunday night, a black brother and, uh, but but not a black wife, not a white wife, Um, brown, let's go, let's go that direction, okay? If either one of them experienced prejudice in employment, housing, anything like that. I would want us to do everything we could to have that inequality addressed in terms of justice. Justice needs to be done. doesn't matter what color their skin is. And if they are, tr- if, they, if they encounter racists, then those racists need to be rebuked. But the same thing is true whether we're talking about Asians. How about 
whether we're talking about Russians. Oh, yeah, Russians. Should, should Russians be discriminated against because they're Russian? Well, they are white. You see, any type of injustice needs to be addressed in a just fashion. And when you demand a particular reading of history and ignore the sufferings the Chinese had, ignore the sufferings the Irish had, my own ancestors, I've shown you pictures on this program. My progenitors came here in abject poverty. Should I demand that I receive the fruits of the labors of other people whose ancestors came with riches because my ancestors were dirt poor? That's what we're getting. That's, that's what you're getting here. That's that's what you're going to hear, it's particularly in its racial dimensions that black people and people of color have not been given are our, our due in terms of equity, in terms of distribution of resources, in terms of opportunity. And it speaks to uh, the idea that we let me ask a question. Are there any black Americans who were given their quote unquote due? Were there, are, have there ever been any rich black Americans? Are there any rich black Americans today? Are, are there rich black Americans who inherited their wealth? Are there rich black Americans who, for example, have received riches from less than beneficial sources? Do we just overlook that? What about white Americans who have been put in difficult positions for holding to positions of morality when they could have gone another direction and, and been benefited. You see, that's, that's the insanity of using race, ethnicity as the standard and saying all blacks are in one group, all whites are another group, all Asians are another group, all Hispanics are in another group. That's just absurdity. It's absurdity on its face. And yet that's that's what we're facing. That's what we're facing to be intentional and be actively working to ensure equity and justice. We can't simply I, I say this in the book. Um, you are either actively working against racism or you are supporting racism, whether actively or passively. Now, how would a Christian oppose racism by living justly in light of God's law, not by being a neo-Marxist, not by demanding that someone give their money, which God says is for their children and their grandchildren to you, not through income redistribution, not through rejecting the fact that God blesses some and not others. None of that. Biblically, but see, this is biblical. You don't get the biblical argument. Like I said, you get the language, but you don't get the debate. Because this stuff is based upon identity politics, critical theory, all that kind of stuff. It's not, it's not based. This is not flowing from the text of scripture. This is coming from out here. And then you form the text of scripture and you make sure to make reference to it. But it's not flowing from the text of scripture at all. Uh, there's no in between. You're supporting that feels it. Offensive. That feels offensive to me. Yeah, well. So remember, anti-racism, you know, Kindy and all, all, all the stuff that's very, very, very popular. These guys are bringing this into the church. And the thing is, anti-racism is actually racism. <laughs> because the, the, the language is under assault. And so if you, for example, say, well, I, I, don't, I don't look at a person's skin color to judge them, um... I actually, you know, sort of fulfilled the dream of Martin Luther. Oh, no, 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 no. You can't do that. Remember when I was just viciously attacked for daring to say that back in, I don't know how long ago it was, but uh, especially since 2018, viciously attacked for that. So anti-racism is actually the promotion of racism. 
And so you're you're put into a sort of Kafka-esque trap here. Is you're either a racist or an anti-racist, but to be an anti-racist is actually biblically to be a racist. So you got no place to go. You know, so it's it's sort of like what I said this morning when I retweeted that video of that guy who killed the 84-year-old just out of hatred, just out of evil. I said, so I'm a racist for breathing, but this guy isn't a racist when he commits first-degree murder just because of his skin color? A society that will actually accept that is a society that's that's laying on its deathbed gasping its last gasps. Sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not being... I'm not being racist, Jamar, just by not being anti-racist. Okay, so that's that's sort of a, a, a negation, a, a, a way of uh, thinking about it in negative terms. But what are you positively doing to support racial justice is the question. I have a black friend. <laughs> <laughs> I, I yes, you you you're, no. you're absolutely uh, right. Um, yeah, his name is Jamar. You're you're what I'm doing. Okay, right, so right, I'm done. Right. Am I good? Are we good? Well, number one, why is it just one? Would they say the same thing about you? Are you assuming a closeness in the relationship that they wouldn't have? And then number two, beyond the the perhaps benefit of, of your one black friend, what are you doing for the masses of people uh, who Howard Thurman says have their backs against the wall, uh, the disinherited, the dispossessed, because we are affected by racism, not just individually or singly, but as a group. So how are we, how are we looking at this in a more broad based way? Okay. So it's not enough to have a black friend. I need to back up and look at the big picture. Darn it, that's homework, Jamar. Okay, uh, but if, if, if someone could write a book that would help me, that would be absolutely fantastic. Why do you use the word uh, equity instead of equality? We want everyone to be equal, right? Right, right, right. Well, it's a common misunderstanding. So equality, people think, basically means treating everyone the same way. The problem is, after hundreds and hundreds of years of inequality and oppression, it's not enough to treat people the same way. It's as if you're running a race and someone has a hundred yard head start. The other person has been chained and can't move. You finally unlock the chain and say, catch up. That's equality. We can both run. Equity is saying, no, we need to do things to make sure I catch up to where you are because you have that head start illegally and unjustly. And in order to to uh, move toward that direction of equality, we can't actually treat everyone the same because we were not historically treated the same way. And so we have to do. So, so you're hearing this, you see, see that, see what the, the end result of all this is the argument today that you have to privilege people because of what happened generations before they came along, rather than doing what Thomas Sowell has pointed out is the only logical thing, and that is to recognize, in reality, the black family was doing pretty good. And what happened? Well, you've, you've got this, and they're going to talk about it here. You're, they even know this. They know these things. They know that the breakup of the black family, and you, it doesn't matter what group you put this into, the presence of the father and the mother in the stable family unit determines how far you're going to go in life, not your color. That's true outside the United States, which means all you're going back to history is a lie. It will not accomplish anything. If you apply, if you did everything that Jamar Tisby and the social justice are saying, it won't stop Chicago. It won't. The violence won't end. So, so you are wasting our time and you're wasting billions of dollars and dividing the nation up with answers that don't accomplish anything. The reality 
of where the origin of these things is, is found in the breakup of the family. Look at what caused that. Look to the people who continue to promote that to this day in the black community. There's your problem. Because you see, it's the same thing north of the border. It's the same thing over in the UK. It's the same thing wherever you want to go. It's called human nature because we're made in the image of God. You already said that, but then you're denying it by the way you argue. Particular things, um, proactive things, affirmative things to make sure that everyone has an equality of opportunity. But what do you say to someone who responds to that and says, well, you just want all the outcomes to be identical and the outcomes are never all identical in life. Jamar. Yeah, I would say. But then notice they are assuming the existence of white privilege. Again, it's all the American type stuff. Now they're talking about what what Saul himself has said repeatedly on this issue. And that is you 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 will never have equality of outcome. And yet, what are the arguments all about? The arguments are based on equality of outcome. We have to do everything we can to create equality of outcome. And if any one group outperforms another, Asian Americans outperform white Americans educationally and in business. So what they're saying is, well, you should do something to disprivilege Asian American privilege. Might it be that there is within the Asian American community an emphasis upon family and tradition and respect that has something to do with this? That you have a more stable family unit there? Yeah, it has everything to do with it. Ah, I, I can't be enough. No. And it can't be enough only in a system where you're trying to fundamentally undo the way America once existed. That's that's why that's why all this is happening. That's that's where it goes. Where did you get that? When did I say that? Um, I would. <laughs> you you want us both to be running side by side through the race and to not have one person finish ahead or behind, even mm -hmm. if they're faster or slower. Mm -hmm. That's what you want. Is that what you want? I want an acknowledgement that people have been deliberately disadvantaged. And okay. But, no, wait. What's that going to accomplish? Will you acknowledge that my ancestors were deliberately disadvantaged? Yes or no? You're a historian, sir. You know they were. There's, there's a very good chance that Jamar Tisby's immediate preceding family members were in far better economic conditions than mine were. So what's that supposed to mean? What, what is this acknowledgement supposed to do? What, what is the consistent stance of penance supposed to accomplish? And if we could just draw this into the Christian faith for a moment, once again, Scythian test failure Ding, 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 ding. We need to come up with a graphic that you can, you can have, you can play on the computer and it'll just flash over me. Scythian test failure. This attitude would have destroyed the apostolic church. If the apostles had allowed the Phil Vishers of the world and the Jamar Tisbees of the world to drag all this stuff into the church, just think of all of the ethnic divisions that are represented in the church at Colossae, in the church at Ephesus, in the church at Rome. And if they had been having to do all this constant penance to one another, they never would have gone to the table together. It's all dealt with at the cross. It's done. But Oh, no, 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 no. We've we've got to we've got to keep pushing. Have to do something about that. I want an explanation for the racial wealth gap. Why it's not only large but still growing. Is your right. response to that that black people are just lazy, haven't been able to do anything with the opportunities they've been given, uh, just want a government? It was welfare, Jamar. It was the welfare that broke. 
everything. Do you know how many people I've had tell me that? The, see, the, see, see, they'll, they know, they know where the real issue is. They know it's in the family. They know that because they have a Christian background. But they suppress it under this socialist Marxist idea that they then promote and, and smile about. I, I just... Obviously, even when I first started listening to Jamar Tisby years ago, you see the trajectory, you see where it's going, but you just hope. You know, it's sort of like looking at the world right now. I look at what's going on and I just hope <laughs> that it's not it's not going to continue going there. Go ahead and take that down because I've I've st I'm only halfway through my list. I'm only halfway through my list. I'm 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 a terrible terrible man. Um, just going way too slowly. Sorry. Um. I did want to just quickly uh, mention <laughs> um, good old Anthony Bradley is back. Uh, Dr. Anthony Bradley. I just wanted to read a, a, a tweet from Dr. Bradley. Now, let me, let me say, I looked at the tweet he was responding to, and I would not have argued the way a guy is a 1689er. And there might be some validity in his pushback and saying, look, just because I put God at that point doesn't make a priority. So, okay, I'll take that. That's not an explanation for what you're going to read here. 1689ers are fundamentalists and usually poor thinkers. Numbering items isn't assigning value. Is this how 1689ers read the Ten Commandments? It might explain why bearing false witness seems irrelevant to them. Whenever I get weird replies, my first thought, must be a 1689er. Do you think do you think there might be a tad bit of prejudice in Dr. Bradley's mind toward Reformed Baptists? I I just get that feeling because this isn't the first time he has gone off on a rant like this. It's sad. It it just really is sad and I am so thankful that I have good Presbyterian brothers that I can argue with that don't reason like this. But it does say something about Dr. Bradley that this is a regular element of his rhetoric. It's it's sad. It, it really, really is. Now, um, let me mention... Um, <laughs> oh, I, I did want to mention this. Uh, close a couple other things here. I'm, I would just, I'd like to pick on um, Gabriel Hughes for a second. Uh, because Gabriel Hughes and I both responded to the same absurd tweet by a guy named Rob Gill. I guess Rob Gill, Rob Gill responded um, uh, to a statement made on the subject of abortion. And Rob Gill said, abortion is health care and no amount of religious yelling will ever change that. Now, this is, by the way, this is the lighthearted part, so don't think I'm actually picking on Gabriel here. Gabriel's response was, abortion is murder, exactly the opposite of health care. Now, that's true. That's... But Gabe, that's just... This, you got to up your Twitter game. Because this, this was my response. And we did, I hadn't seen his before I wrote mine. Here's my response. Abortion is health care in the same world where aerial carpet bombing is building improvement. Now, Rich laughed because he got it. Now, which one you're going to remember? You're going to remember the aerial carpet bombing as home improvement, right? So, Gabriel, you got you got to pick up your Twitter game, dude. You know, if you're you spoke the truth, we'll give you we'll give you fifty percent on that, but you just you gotta, yeah, yeah. Just gotta do that. Just want to take a shot out there. Make sure he knew I was watching. <laughs> I'll watch Twitter here to see if anything, anything pops up like, oh no, I'm getting picked on the dividing line because I, you know, anyway. All right. Okay. One last thing here. Why do I have that in my ear? I don't know. Um, I get tired of having that in my ear. 
I said I would get to the our King James fellow. I've still got it queued up. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. I want to just spend a few more minutes. You know, for years, for decades, Rich will tell you for decades. I have avoided as best I possibly can the discussion of eschatology for one simple reason. I learned a long time ago, and I don't know why I remember this one night so well, but I remember, and this was so long ago that Rich, it was me and Mike that went to a Baptist church over in Peoria, I think. Maybe downtown Glendale. You know, oh, it's downtown Glendale. That's how long ago. I think it may have been even before you came along. And I was going to give a presentation on Mormonism, but we're sitting there at the beginning of the service, and there was something in the pew. And I remember taking it out and reading it. It was something about like a statement of faith type thing. And man, it was straight up uh, pre-millennial, pre-trib rapture only. I mean, that was that was literally the central aspect of the statement of faith. <laughs> was pre-mill, pre-trib. We also happen to be Trinitarian. <laughs> it's, just, it's just sort of like, ah! So I was... I just remember that and going, wow, you know, that that's that's imbalanced. You know, the, the Trinity, there's a lot of other stuff a whole lot more important than, you know, you, you've got two paragraphs on that and then five paragraphs on on your very specific eschatological perspective. And so it's not an issue that I've ever done a debate on. And I just can't see that happening at all. But even as I developed in that area, I just always had in the back of my mind, man, it just seems that people hold their viewpoints here, not because they've fairly listened to any other viewpoint, but because this is just the best combat kickboxing theological area that you could ever find. Do you remember? Did you, I'm not don't remember if you heard. But when Steven Anderson was here, you're obviously involved in typing to someone right now, and I'll I'll wait till you're Are you taking notes. Oh, you're you're putting in the stuff on the on the thing. He's sitting there typing away. I'm trying to talk to him. You know, I'm trying to get him involved here. Um, but you remember when Steven Anderson came over? At, was it before or after the interview? He was staying behind my desk. And he went off on, I think it was Gip. But it had to do with whether you're pre, mid, or post- because he's not pre. Isn't he mid? I think he, I think back then he may have been mid-trib. Now, the vast majority of Christians down through history, because all that stuff developed in the 1800s, the vast majority of Christians down through history would not have had a clue what any of that was about. What any of that was about. But for a lot of folks, man, that is... There are churches that you could walk into that you could not slide a piece of paper between them. They are so identical in their hymns, in their preaching, in everything that will not have anything to do with the other one because of a slight difference. It's not slight to them. I realize that, but a slight difference in an eschatological conclusion. So I know I've listened to pre-tribbers identify mid-tribbers as heretics who are going to hell. So they're pre-millennial, but pre-trib, 
mid-trib, and they turn it into a gospel issue, and those people are going to hell. I've seen that for, for so long that it's just, especially at times like these, where we've got big issues, that it just seems like a real waste of time to be fighting about stuff like that. But at the same time, especially right now, I'm sitting back going, how shall we then live? <laughs> Great title. Someone should come up with a video series <laughs> by that title. How, how shall we then live? How then shall we live? Obviously talking about Schaefer. We are having, we are, every single one of us, I don't care whether you're a Christian leader, we all have to be making decisions about how we are going to live our lives in the future. We will not be given the option of simply muddling along in the same old ways we have in the past. The church is going to be changing. How we worship is going to be changing. How we're meeting is going to be changing. Everything is changing. And I believe you, me, Rich will tell you, I hate that. I like sameness. I, I've, I've mentioned it before. I'll go ahead and confess it now in front of the whole world. Starting from the time I could drive, once I got my license, right before Christmas break of 1978, I had a beat up old 72 Buick LeSabre. It had already been in an accident. We had gotten it all repaired. We called it the Brown Bomb. And Rich remembers the Brown Bomb because I gave the Brown Bomb to a friend of Rich. I don't know whatever happened to the Brown Bomb, but do you know whatever happened to Brown Bomb? The heater would never turn off. Well, that's that would help with the with the engine temperature. <laughs> Sort of that just added to the to the to the cooling of the radiator. I know, I know, I know. No, 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 no. That was 350. No, 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 no. That was 350. But that was a good 350. It uh, it only got about nine miles to the gallon. But hey, anyway. Um as soon as I had a car, I would leave campus because I, I could describe to you the burritos that we had in the cafeteria at Independence High School, but I don't want to because you might be eating. <laughs> they were bad, really bad. And so I started leaving the campus. And for the rest of my sophomore year, my junior year, my senior year, five days a week during the school year, I drove to the McDonald's at 67th Avenue, and Bethany Home Road. And I got the same thing for two and a half years. Quarter pound of cheese, ketchup, mustard, mustard only, fries, and a medium Coke, easy ice. They would have it waiting for me. I mean, they, they knew I was coming. So I like sameness. I <laughs> had the same thing. Okay. Once in a while, I'd have a large fry <laughs> rather than a medium fry. Whoa, a little bit of change there. A little spice things up a bit. Maybe a large Coke instead of a medium Coke. Yeah, sameness. And on Saturdays, my dad will tell you, he'd bring me the same thing when I was working at the radio station. So I would go six days with the same thing for lunch. And it, wouldn't, it would not bother me in the least. I like sameness. I'm not going to get to have sameness in the future. And neither are you. Our world is changing. There's quote unquote new normal. There's not going to be a normal. Our world has changed right in front of us and not for the better. And it's going to keep changing. So what am I called to do as a Christian? What is the church called to do? I, I'm a pastor of a church. And so I have to be in dialogue with my fellow elders, with the deacons. And we have to be making very important decisions 
as to what is most important to the church. Obviously, we believe the meeting of the church, proclamation of the word, the supper, baptism, very, very important. We also believe very clearly in our church, children are to be raised in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and are to be protected from the influences of ungodly men and women. And so, vast majority of our children are homeschooled, some are in Christian schools. That's part of the commitment. They're there with us in the service. But how do you fulfill that, and why? Is investing your very wealth and energy and time in finding ways to communicate the faith far into the future to be a benefit to your children's grandchildren. Is that a waste of time? Is that a waste of time? Those are questions that have eschatological implications. And it's no longer, you know, five years ago, that post mill was a hashtag that was really cool. Sort of like having a beard and smoking a stogie. Real cool. Um, the future is not going to have cool in it. Not that kind of cool. And so, I don't know if you saw this, because you didn't mention it to me. You didn't say anything about it. But a guy named Ed Dingus, did you see it? Did a webcast about James White's dance with post-millennialism. Which made me laugh immediately because I have danced exactly once in my entire life at my daughter's wedding. <laughs> so obviously doesn't know me very well. <clears throat> but it was a webcast, so I didn't I hadn't taken the time to listen to it. But Jeff told me about it, and he said, I want to respond, especially to what he said about Noah. Then I saw on Facebook, Gary DeMar said, uh, mentioned it and said, I feel a blog post coming. <laughs> well, Gary posted his blog post, I think this morning, maybe last evening, where he, all he did was he interacted with what Dingus had said, which basically was post-millennialists never deal with what Noah said about the last days. And so one of the things that I've learned as I'm studying eschatology, but I'm not studying, I'm not studying eschatology the way I would have five years ago. And I think that's a good thing because I'll be honest with you. Every time in the past, I've decided I really need to dig into this. And there's a bunch of books I've got and da, 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 da. I just could not get my heart into it. My heart's into it now. Why? Because it has to be. Because I'm having to think about how to prioritize all of life in light of the possibility of the loss of the freedoms that made eschatology a side issue in the past but is now making it central to the serious decision as to how the church is to continue in light of what's going on globally today. And so there's, there's a part of me that's going, I wonder if this is why I've just never, because there've been some times I'm like, oh, you know, I really feel like that's a weak area. I need to need to delve into it. And I just couldn't. Because it was still, it's just that area over there. Now, 
I'm asking myself the question, what do I communicate to my grandchildren to prepare them to suffer for Christ? I've baptized two of my granddaughters. So when I use the phrase suffer for Christ, I know what that means. And so remember a few weeks ago, I talked about that article about the Uyghur woman and what she suffered under Chinese torture, really, for two years. And I'm thinking, how would I respond? How would my children respond? How would my grandchildren respond? What would give them the foundation to survive in that situation with the world coming at them, denying everything they believe, telling them that everything that they've been taught is, is complete mythology. It's all been disproven. What do I do? And should I even be bothering? Is that what Christian faithfulness looks like right now? And so when I responded to Pastor MacArthur, I did so with great respect, but I've already seen this is not an area you can talk about with the vast majority of Christian people. They will not listen to what you're saying unless you agree with them. They just won't. One of the things I appreciate about RC is he had held all the different views at some point in his life. And so one thing I'm discovering for certain is as I read, there are, when it comes to eschatology, there is a tendency to only want the echo chamber and to only read within what you think is your group. So the representations of other positions are normally highly fallacious. And my, my understanding is Dingus said that that's what I did. And the only thing I can think of, because I wasn't even defining other positions, was the only definition I did give, which I gave in the blog article and on the program, was in regards to an escapist versus an endurantist perspective. And what I pointed out was, that's not totally defined by your eschatological position. So most premillennialists would say that before anything like what we can see coming on the horizon would actually come, we're out of here. That's what they're saying. Amillennialists and amillennialism, whether they want to admit it or not, is a subcategory of postmillennialism because both believe that Christ returns after a millennium. They just, the difference between amillennialists and postmillennialists is on the nature of the millennium. The difference between postmillennialists and premillennialists is on the timing of the coming of Christ in relationship to the millennium. That's why it gets really confusing. Not only do you have optimistic amillennialism and pessimistic amillennialism and difference amongst postmillennialists, and of course the premillennialists are tossing each other in hell over pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and historical premillennialism versus dispensational premillennialism. And you can, you can understand why most Christians just go, you know, I'm going to go with what I got when I first got, became a Christian, and I'm not going to worry about anything else. Okay, I get it. That was an option up till about now, but now we got to think it through because it does determine what where you're going to put your emphasis, where you're going to put your, your time, your money, your life. So my conclusion, I haven't come to a conclusion, but my conclusion is that there's a lot of misrepresentation and a lot of people who hold to certain positions very firmly have never read anything from the other perspective. Seriously. So I'm sitting here, I've read books on premillennialism, 
as a premillennialist. I've read books on amillennialism as an amillennialist. I'm now reading books on postmillennialism. And one thing that is very, very clear to me is the amillennialists, there's a group of them that know that they need to deal with postmillennialism, especially over the past 20 years. There was a time at the end of the last century where postmillennialism was just considered dead. Just not even worry about it. There are amillennialists who will interact with that. But it seems to me that the postmillennialists are the ones reading the other guy's stuff more. Though there's more of a focus on amillennialism than there is on premillennialism. But they're reading these other perspectives and interacting with these perspectives. They really are. But one thing absolutely certain is there is a real tendency to misrepresentation and straw manning rather than dealing with the best the other side has to offer. And that's, look, that's how life is. I, I get it. But I really do not believe that there is anything misrepresentational at all in simply pointing out in this situation that we are facing right now, whether we are going to endure and, and feel that we are called to endure and to look toward a future of the church and what it's going to look like, or whether you think that's a waste of time that we just lose down here and it's done. That is a big issue. And I can see amillennialists who will come to different conclusions on that because it sort of depends on how you flesh stuff out. But here's, here's, I'm trying, I'm sort of bringing you along in this, in this journey. One thing that is becoming very clear to me and that means a lot to me is that in light of where we are, but in light of what people have said in the past and how their, their positions have been enunciated. What is most important? I think we can all, I hope we can all agree. Well, okay, we're not going to all agree. Never mind. There's, I'm talking about eschatology. Um, I would like if we all could agree that judging eschatology by current events is dangerous. It is a, we just can't go there. Because you would have a different eschatology for every single, you'd have a different eschatology every decade, basically. You'd have a different eschatology for every executive order. It's true. We, we, we can't do that. We can't go there. And I've told you that from a church history perspective, that's one of the biggest things is that I know looking at church history, there are times over and over again down through church history that you would have come to a completely different conclusion. You can't do that. And let's be honest, I've got in my office a lot of books on eschatology, primarily premillennial books on eschatology. And the Central focus is current events. What's going on in Israel? What happened in 1948? Uh, what's going on with the seven year, seven day war? And, and da, 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 da. I mean, you've seen them. You know what I'm talking about. The Hal Lindsay's, uh, right? You, I know. I know. I know. So that's big. That, that is an important issue. But here, I'm taking too much time. Sorry. Well, let me get, get to this. The conclusions I'm coming to are based upon overarching biblical promises about the entire purpose of God in creation. That should be where we're coming from. The big picture. Not the narrow picture. The big picture. And right now we're memorizing, as part of our catechism study at church, we are memorizing what we call, what, uh, what Jeff calls God's favorite Bible verse. <laughs> and you might go, that's a really weird statement. But I think I've mentioned it before. 
God's favorite Bible verse is Psalm 1101. Why? Because it is the most often cited text in the New Testament from the Old Testament. Yahweh says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying, rule in the midst of your enemies. Verses one and two, and that's from the NASB rather than the ESV, which I'm having to read each Sunday and it's messing up my memorization. But this is Yahweh speaking to the Messiah. This is the fulfillment that is given in the New Testament. Yahweh says to my Lord, well, this is David's Lord. So remember, Jesus quotes this and says, how can the Messiah be David's Lord if he's his son? So Jesus even applied this verse to himself. There's no way around it. All right. So it's key. It's as key as Genesis 15, 6. But what does it say? Yahweh says to my Lord, here's the promise of the father to the son. Sit at my right hand. When, when did Jesus arrive at the right hand of the father? At his resurrection. So the assumption is the completion of the redemptive work. Sit at my right hand until I do what? Make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Is that what God's been doing since the ascension of Jesus to heaven? He's making Jesus' enemies a footstool for his feet. It's been 2,000 years. Yahweh will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion saying what? Rule in the midst of your enemies. Christ is ruling in the midst of his enemies? He is. He is. How does that flesh out? Well, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm, I'm not going to take too much longer, but I, I, I want you to see this. I, I just want you to hear how these overarching themes, because whatever eschatology you end up landing on, it's because you have said, these are the key issues. These are the key themes. And then you put everything else in order underneath that. And we all have to do it. We all have to do it. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Sound a little bit like Psalm 110, verse 2? For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all be made alive. Does this, does this sound like overarching, broad categories on Paul's part here? Mm, yeah, it is. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom of the, uh, to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. So when does this happen? When he has abolished all rule and authority and power. Now, how's he doing that? You see, certain eschatological perspectives see that all happening, boom. Armageddon, boom. Instant expression of divine power to destroy enemies. Then why have we been waiting around for 2,000 years? Is Christ, is not the promise of God the Father to the Son that he will put his enemies as a footstool under his feet? Isn't that what's been happening all along for 2,000 years? Well, yes, but only spiritually when people come to know Jesus. Well, I agree. That is a part of it. There's no question about that. But is that, is that all that rule amongst your enemies means? How, what, how does enemies work? Because see, if Christ's rulership in his kingdom is only spiritual and thence in the church, then what does it mean to rule amongst your enemies? For he must reign 
until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Ding, 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 ding. Psalm 110. The last enemy that will be abolished, and that's an interesting, um, to, to be made of no effect, destroyed, to be made idle. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. So all the other enemies to, to Christ will be abolished and made empty before that. So if your, if your conclusion is that's all just going to happen, boom. Okay. But we've already seen God doing that down through history. So if that's his intention to continue doing that, and he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that will be abolished is death, and it's been a process in building the church, then that has a lot to do with how we should be looking toward the future today. That's, that's the conclusion I'm coming to. And these are big, these are big picture considerations. They're not anything to do about 1948. Right? They're, they don't have anything to do with how many nations are in the United Nations. They have everything to do with what is God's overarching purpose in continuing to have the body of Christ on earth after Jesus has ascended to the presence of the Father. That's big picture stuff. That's big picture stuff. So, if it is God's purpose that he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet, then my calling as a Christian minister is to pass the faith on in such a way that the enemies of Christ will be put under his lordship, under his feet. That does not mean that it has to be better next year than it is this year. And that's what I'm thinking about right now. That's, that's where a lot of my thinking is right now. And I, I want to have some conversations with some, with some folks. Because everybody will say, well, look, this progression is not a straight line progression. There have been ups and downs through the history of the church. There have been some really dark times during the history of the church. But I'm just going to share with you what I'm thinking. Okay? I know I've gone a little long, but rolls not going to end. Here's what I'm thinking. By what means will the newest enemy to Christ be placed under his feet? And what's the newest enemy to Christ? What is the greatest means of denying the Lordship of Christ? amongst humanity today globally? Is it not the madness of secularism that has been released amongst the children of Darwin? You see, up till this time period, Rome's gods have been subjected. Polytheism? Yeah. But now, what's the greatest challenge that I can see historically? to the Lordship of Christ is to deny there is any God at all, not just atheism as atheism, but atheism as a worldview based upon the secular worldview, naturalism, scientism as it exists today. And what might be one way, spectacular way to absolutely drive from the minds of the sons of men, any inkling of ever going down this dark path again, except a descent into the deepest darkness as a result of it. I don't want to go there. What I'm saying is, 
if it happens, it doesn't change the reality of the empty tomb and the purposes of God. That's what I'm thinking about. Yes, sir? And uh, to dovetail in with that, circling back to the very beginning of the show, are, are, are we allowed to identify the self-proclaimed enemies of God? Isn't that what the whole J.D. Greer conflict is yeah. all about? He's upset. Danny's upset. These guys are all upset because we're over here identifying the enemies of God, not because of their, their sex or their skin tone or any of that. We're looking at the things that they're declaring to be good. And what are they declaring to be good? The, woe to them who call good evil and evil good. It's true. If, if somebody wants to take a good hard look at one of the big questions we've received so many, for so many years in dealing with Mormonism, what was the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Mm. Your heart is so hard that you can look at the deeds of the devil and call them good. Right. You can look at the deeds and the miracles of the Son of God and say he does it by the Prince of Beelzebub. That's how we explained it. Let me... Let me ex explain that in case anyone's missing what we're saying. The I had a professor, wonderful man in Bible college, Dr. D.C. Martin, and he had a sp special question on his tests in New Testament. And the question was, why is the unpardonable sin unpardonable? And there is only one answer, and you could you could have passed his test on this. There's only one answer he would accept on that test because it's impardonable. Now you might say that's not an answer, but if you gave the answer, it's because you understood what he had said in class. And that was his emphasis was upon the fact that since this is against the Holy Spirit of God and the Spirit of God is the mechanism by which repentance is brought to any individual, DC was a little more reformed than I think people give him credit for. Since it is against the spirit who brings repentance, then you are pushing away the very one who would bring repentance anyways, and that's what makes it unpardonable. So that was what that was all about. And what he was saying was, when you have so much light and you sin against that light, that's where the great danger lies. And we have plenty of light as to what, there is no question as to what mankind is, as to what women are, what men are, their relationship in scripture. And so to have the kind of revolution going on right now, and we are not absolutely crystal clear, this is not something to whisper about. This is something to be very bold about because the judgment that will come upon it will be a tremendous judgment. There is no two ways about it. Well, anyways, I have now gone way, way beyond the time period that I was supposed to go. I apologize. And I still didn't get the King James stuff, but that's okay. We will get to it. Um, I hope that final discussion was at least thought provoking for many of you, because it's certainly provoking a lot of thought for me right now. So we'll talk more about that in the future. Thanks for listening to the program today. Again, who knows if it will be our last program. Because I said plenty today that would, that as I've said more things today than other people said that have gotten them removed. So there you go. Always save, always download. Always look to aomin.org if we do disappear. Thanks for watching. God bless.